greatest entrepreneur that Singapore has seen is Dr. Goh. He was very much ahead of his time. Dr. Goh was someone who could come up with fresh ideas, fresh insights. Dr. Goh has a sense of mission. When he felt that something had to be done, he would do it. I had no initial vision. You just started and hope for the best. <laughs> if you have a vision, that means you're a dreamer. <laughs> I'm not a dreamer. He may not have been a dreamer, but many will say Dr. Goking Sui was a visionary. And it was his unseen hand which had helped build Singapore. When Dr. Goh left politics in 1984, then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew wrote in tribute, a whole generation of Singaporeans take their present standard of living for granted because you had laid the foundations of the economy of modern Singapore. Some years ago, the Prime Minister told me that Dr. Goh would be retiring at the end of this term and asked me to try and persuade him to stay on. I did not because I think Dr. Go has done more than enough for Singapore. But Dr. Go wasn't just Singapore's economic and social architect. He also played a significant role in Singapore's political destiny, the full extent of which was unknown even to former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew for 30 years after independence. Go Keng Sui, was born on 6 October 1918 to a middle-class family in Malacca, Malaya. He came to Singapore at the age of two and was later educated at the Anglo-Chinese school before going to study economics at Raffles College. It was as a tutor at Raffles College that he first met Lee Kuan Yew. He worked as a civil servant till World War II came to Singapore with the Japanese occupation. Experience is a harsh school, but for Gokeng Sui, who wrote these words in 1977, the years under colonial rule were the harder teacher. The promising civil servant had carried out a social survey of Singapore. His experience led to a deep disgust at the incompetence of the island's colonial rulers. He found poverty and squalor were the order of the day, with eight in ten households living in one room or less than. He railed against this, even in an interview 40 years on. The British had no business to run Singapore. They were incompetent. They were incompetent. The people over you, they knew nothing. After the war, a scholarship took him to the London School of Economics. His political awakening came during a trip to Hungary for the World Federation of Democratic Youth Meeting. And it was in Britain that he started the pro-independence Malayan Forum with other student leaders from Singapore and Malaya. Amongst them were Lee Kuan Yew and To Chin Chai. Together, they went on to found the People's Action Party in 1954. After obtaining his PhD on a University of London scholarship in 1956, Dr. Goh rejoined the civil service, but not for long. He quit to contest the 1959 Legislative Assembly election on a PAP ticket. His motivation, he said, was to get rid of the British. A new phase in his life had begun. For more than 30 years ago, a group of returned students looked at colonial Singapore and decided that they had a mission to change a the system. Then they applied the lessons they learned in British universities, set about building a trade union following, and in 1954 formed the People's Action Party. It was an act of reckless folly. 
Mercifully for them and for Singapore, they did not receive the punishment they richly deserved. But history was to prove that that was no act of reckless folly. That year, the PAP was victorious in the country's first general election. Self-government had become a reality, and with it, the task of building a new nation from scratch. Providing jobs and housing a people were pressing demands, labor unrest was common. It was also the start of a decade-long battle with the communists and winning over the unemployed who were susceptible to communism. I was fortunate in that I had a very good, very strong colleague in Dr. Go King Sui. So I appointed him finance minister because that was the most important portfolio. If we don't get the finance right, then nothing else can be done. I'm damned if I knew anything about, uh, you know, running a country different from reading economic textbooks. Uh, fortunately, I knew the ambassador uh, to, of Israel was then posted in Bangkok. And uh, I told him, look, let me spend some time in your country. Have a look at uh, how you set up industries, because at that time, Israel was really good. The only economist in this first Singapore cabinet, Dr. Goh's strategy was to build a manufacturing sector to attract foreign multinational corporations to invest, and so provide jobs very quickly. Well, he was, I would say, a bit... A, very much ahead of his time, he welcomed foreign investments. And that, at that time, the mood was fearful. Uh, people were, f a lot of nations were frightened of MNCs. They thought they were exploiters, they were uh, imperialist front organizations. But Dr. Go was very sure that they would do more good than harm on balance, that they would provide markets for Singapore. In 1961, Dr. Goh set up the Economic Development Board with the sole objective of attracting foreign MNCs here. Jurong was part of that strategy. Jurong, a name that will make Singapore famous in a new way. 15,000 acres of swamp would be turned into a modern industrial park. They were full of uncertainties. Dr. Goh himself openly admitted when he started uh, Jurong, he said, uh, this is an act of faith. And uh, he himself uh, jokingly said that uh, this could prove to be uh, Goh's folly. I mean, he himself said that. Uh, but he persevered. There were, there were many, many problems. First of all, you know, Jurong is, uh, was a swamp. Uh, you had to create the factories there, and you had to get workers to live there. It was a big, big uh, uphill battle to persuade people to uh, go there. I mean, at that time, uh, people you know, had little knowledge of industry. And... Uh, they, they were naturally quite skeptical, uh, but we don't care. We just press on. And press on he did. When nobody wanted to move to the new frontier town, Dr. Go ordered the installation of toll gates on the main road leading into Jurong. The message got through. It would be cheaper for workers to live in Jurong instead of being bused to the factories each day. People began moving in and Jurong began to boom. By 1968, over 150 factories were operating here, and the toll was never imposed. Dr. Goh had played hardball and won, but he was just as hard on himself. Despite a strong personal aversion to publicity, he actively opened and visited factories, making speech after speech, a personal touch which helped to win over investors. And the MNCs and workers came, but soon, another hurdle appeared. Dr. Goh had counted on a common market with Malaysia because of... 
Dr. Goh had counted on a common market with Malaysia because of Singapore's small domestic market. Barely 17 days ago, I had the privilege of presenting pioneer certificates to 33 manufacturing enterprises. The inclusion of a further 44 new manufacturing enterprises in such a short space of time is ample testimony of the genuine benefits which Malaysia and the common market will bring to Singapore. But that was not to be. Despite earlier agreements for a common market, Singapore continued facing restrictions when trading with Malaysia. Differences over tax and finance also exacerbated tensions over sensitive race issues. In 1965, after two stormy years, Singapore was out of Malaysia. Dr. Goh had a part to play in the separation. He had been asked by then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew to press for a looser arrangement for Malaysia and Singapore within the Federation of 14 States. But Dr. Goh went beyond his mandate. Having concluded that the only way out was for Singapore to exit completely from the Federation, he negotiated for a total hiving off with then Malaysian Deputy Prime Minister Tun Amsul Razak instead. Back in 1965, there was no time to dwell on the whys and wherefores. Singapore had to survive on its own and fast. Building its economy and its defence were urgent tasks. In 1968, the British announced it was pulling its troops out of Singapore in 1971. That was another crisis. In 1972, they would spend nothing, for they would all have left. The total reductions in expenditure for the four years, 1968 to 1971, is $900 million. 90 millions in 1968, 180 millions in 1969, and so on. If these uh, things were allowed to take the natural cause, the result would be a severe and protracted economic recession. But the fighter in Dr. Goh was not to be defeated by either the separation from Malaysia or the British pullout. He accelerated Singapore's drive to become an export-oriented economy. When we separated from Malaysia, he got hold of some people and myself. He said, look, we must earn our living from as far away as possible. He said, never earn our living from our neighbours. He said, he told both of us that. And that's why we went to scout, scout for investment from the Americans, the Japanese, everybody, you see. Because the moment you, earn, you have to earn your living from your neighbours, you know, just like uh, neighbours always quarrel with each other. So that was our strategy. Our strategy was the world. Dr. Goh was equally prescient when it came to the currency talks after separation. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Finance Minister Lim Kim Sun had favoured a common currency with Malaysia. My Goh King Sui, he, 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 was very, he was very, I think at that time it looks to, to us to be very hard. He said, look, there will always be a, break, be a breaking point in this currency talks. So you better hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And we prepared for the world. That's how within six months of the breakdown, or one year, we issue our own currency. Going its own way on the currency issue gave Singapore full control over all its monetary and financial policies. When a strong financial system was needed to support the many foreign investors brought in, Dr. Goh gave more licenses to foreign banks to operate in Singapore. It was during this time that uh, the uh, Asian currency unit, you know, the offshore US dollar uh, currency unit was established in Singapore. Uh, and uh, other financial measures were undertaken to make Singapore more hospitable for, uh, uh, for big financial operations. So the Development Bank of Singapore was set up as a financing institution led by the government. Dr. Goh also set up Churong Town Corporation to drive the industrialization strategy. And he agreed to tax concessions at a time when it wasn't popular to do so. 
certainly um, when you make tax concessions, it is always a very difficult decision to, to make because, you know, I think uh, it is seen as losing revenue. And it is also an irrevocable, irrevocable step in the sense that once you've given a concession, it is very difficult to take it back. Despite this forward bold move, Dr. Goh was at heart a very prudent economist who believed in the currency board system. He believed in spending only what the country had and in saving a good bit on the side. Even up to now, uh, we cannot just print money as we like. He never believed in deficit financing. And for every dollar that we print, it has been backed up by at least an equivalent of one dollar of foreign exchange. This prudence led to a significant growth in savings in Singapore. He was very tight-fisted and I think that was reflected in the way he ran uh, the state. Every time wages were allowed to go up, more and more was put into savings, into CPF. Now, that was very much uh, uh, not just Dr. Goh, but the, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, both of them felt very strongly that all this money should not just suddenly be given to the workers uh, to be splurged, but that they should build up their savings. And of course, they can use their savings to buy uh, homes, invest and so on, but it's basically not consumed. A person who's had a narrow escape with his life soon sees marriage in the habit of prudence. This is exactly what happened to us. Machiavelli in The Prince said this, Men with their usual lack of prudence are fond of innovations and liking the first taste fail to see the poison within. Having failed at the beginning of our political career to see the poison within, we are always on the lookout for poison in new situations. This wariness led to another preemptive shake-up, this time at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where Dr. Goh had been appointed chairman in 1981. When I was there, he, uh, I think the Prime Minister at the time, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, asked him to look at uh, whether we were uh, managing our reserves well uh, at that time, then uh, he uh, um, did a review of the MBS and decided to set up the uh, GIC because he felt that uh, this would lead to more effective uh, management of our reserves. And I think that turned out to be right. He was far ahead of his time uh, setting up an independent uh, an investment management firm uh, in order to manage the government reserves uh, which were not needed for currency uh, controls. And Singapore did amass large reserves from just one billion Sing dollars after independence to over 22 billion when Dr. Goh retired in 1984. On one occasion we happened to be in Bangkok for some conference and one day in the hotel lobby I saw him panting and puffing and coming into the from uh, in the hotel door uh, uh, sweating profusely so we asked him you know what did you do I mean, why, why are you uh, in, in this state and he said I've been walking for the last uh, four blocks from the hotel because I wanted to hail a minicab and uh, they wanted to charge me an atrocious sum, so I forget what the sum was, but for us it was very little money, but to him it was quite a lot. This same frugality had led Dr. Goh to propose establishing a bird park before a zoo. I said, why a bird park? Why not a zoo? You know, he said, oh, Giam, do you think that seeds cost less than meat? Bird seeds cost less than meat. It's that kind of, you know. He used the term robust approach in economics or in budgeting. Robust approach. But Dr. Goh was concerned with more than just practicalities. Here was this bird park right in the centre of an industrial estate. And we thought if the birds cannot survive, it will be quite a clear indication that uh, you know, the place was very polluted. But he actually wanted Jurong to be more than just 
a, 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 a smokestack uh, area, uh, more than an industrial area. And he thought in terms of the Jurong Hill, with some, uh, some uh, uh, restaurants and so on, a bird park where people could go and see beautiful birds. Uh, he was the one who started the zoo. So he, he was more than just uh, you know, an economic uh, planner and an implementer of policy. Independence in 1965 meant Singapore had to build up its own defences quickly. Singapore's first finance minister became its first interior and defence minister. He was motivated by the conviction that Singaporeans must be in charge of their own destiny. We must never forget that our existence as an independent sovereign state cannot be made to depend on the sufferance of others. The most dependable guarantee of our independence is a strong SAF. A strong SAF in turn depends on the political will to make the effort and pay the price. And the political will was clear. From the way approaches were made to several countries like Egypt and India to help Singapore develop its army, to the final decision to have Israeli advisors in when no one else would help. But that was only the beginning. He recognized that we cannot be like the Israelis. At the same time, he recognizes we cannot be like the British. So what we did over time was to evolve. So we had, uh, you know, the Israelis helping with the army, the British helping with the Air Force, and uh, the, the New Zealanders helping with the Navy. And, uh, you know, our anti-aircraft system, at one stage, you know, we even had Greek. We, even with the British helping us with the Air Force, he had two Israeli Air Force advisors here. So, you know, to, 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 to check. I think... Uh, it's only somebody like Dr. Go who can pull a thing off like that, you know. In 1967, national service was introduced. It wasn't a popular policy in an Asian society which felt that good sons do not become soldiers. But unpopularity did not bother Dr. Go. What mattered was the soundness of the policy. To him, it was one way a fledgling nation could ramp up a fairly large defence force without going broke. The shared experience of national service would also bond the people speedily. To get a corps of officers ready to train the first batch of NS men, Dr. Go gave the go-ahead for SAFTI, a military training institute to be set up. We had a glossy booklet prepared with the commando officer Clarence Tan uh, on the, with a red sports car driving. To, to attract people, that was a good life. It was, a, you know, the glamorous life. It was a man's life to join the army. So we had to do all that. But we had good response. We had more than 2,000 people applying for, uh, to join SAFTI for training and uh, minimum qualifications for school cert. But we also had some graduates and uh, we had people from various backgrounds. So the first 300 were selected. Getting NS accepted widely took more efforts. Send-off dinners were held. 5,000 NS medallions contributed by the Chinese Chamber of Commerce were given to the first batches of NS men. They also received simple packages of toiletries presented by community leaders. And political leaders took the lead. Dr. Go himself was made a colonel of the artillery. To get national service popular, he had to lead in that sense. And so he turned up and colonel's uniform. So that was publicized. So I, I think the young people liked it. By the time the 1972 general election came round, male Singaporeans had known a few years of NS. Dr. Goh was uncontested in his Crater Eye Award, while the PAP received 70.4% of the popular vote. I'm quite sure my colleague, Minister for Defence, Dr. Go King Sui, is happy that uh, the policy of national service has been successfully tested and has 
been found to receive majority support. I think it's a good thing to have a, a general election now because uh, we can then get down to serious business to face all the new problems that Singapore will, will be uh, meeting. And we'll, 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 we'll uh, overcome these problems and difficulties of the future as we've done in the past. I think uh, we can steer the country to a good future. Dr. Go was the man Lee Kuan Yew would turn to whenever there was a crucial task. And today I can say without any reservation, if I am confronted with a military problem, I will not only consult the SAF General Star, I will also have a quiet word with Dr. Go because he has read up and studied the art of war and the science of weaponry. He applied himself. It is a total discipline in itself. He has, you name them and he's read them. Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, Little Heart. He used to pass me in the books. I say, wait a minute. I'm not your chief of staff and I don't want to be. He says, no, you're prime minister. You must know this. He always operated on philosophy that if he was minister of defense, uh, he always uh, ought to be fully alert as to what is going on uh, and therefore if the Prime Minister were to come along to raise something uh, he, if he had been very good as a Defence Minister, would have thought about it before the Prime Minister. So I think that also was in many ways an inspiration to many people who worked in MINDEF. The fact that um, when we are in charge of something uh, we feel deep responsibility to know everything that's going on. He knew that Dr. Goh was someone who could come up with fresh ideas, fresh insights. And when you start something, you have nothing to fall back on and follow precedence and, and, and do it the same way that other people did it. And so if you had a completely new project, say if you didn't have an SAF and you had to start an SAF, Dr. Goh would be ideal because he had the depth and the, uh, of perspective and insights to produce solutions and start afresh with no benchmarks to fall back on. He read widely. You couldn't pull a fast one. I remember somebody who wanted to sell a plane or something came to him. And of course, you know, volumes of papers came about saying how good it is and so on. All he called up and said, the man came, you know, typical salesman. I wouldn't want to name the country. He said, oh, has this plane, uh, where has this plane been used? Which terrain? Next plane is. Have you sold it to anybody? Not yet. Okay, thank you. When you have sold it to somebody and has been used in combat, come and talk to me. Finished. Conversation ended. Uh, agenda item passed in five minutes. When the British withdrew their troops from Singapore in 1971, Dr. Goh seized the opportunity to turn adversity into opportunity on the defence front. It became the catalyst which speeded up the growth of Singapore's own armed forces. In three years, he had tripled the army strength. One of the things which um, impressed me most was there was this saying by Dr. Goh, which you could see in various SEF units and in MINDEF, um, where they quoted him as saying that the only way to avoid making mistakes is not to do anything. And that, in the final analysis, will be the ultimate mistake. Uh, I, I think that the uh, spirit of change, the spirit of trying, the spirit of innovation, a spirit always of questioning um, uh, what you ought to do for the future, because you cannot assume that what you're doing today is good enough for the future. Uh, so I think that kind of spirit pervades the whole of MINDEF. Although he saw defence spending as necessary, Dr. Goh's economic training and frugal nature was always searching for more productive ways to spend the money. At one time, military officers from the various... At one time, military officers from the various bases, they would go to the HQ for meetings or to go to other bases for meetings and they would 
get there using their Land Rovers. When Dr. Go discovered that per kilometer basis, it is more expensive to use a Land Rover than an ordinary car, he immediately forbid units to use the Land Rovers for urban driving. That's for the war front, for rough terrain, it's built for it. As a result, it's not cost effective to use them. Immediate instruction. No waste. The entrepreneur in Dr. Go also decided to take a shot at producing military hardware at lower costs. One day, I remember I was asked to bring a M16 rifle to his office and uh, to strip it right in front of him. He then went through the various parts and to identify which were the parts that were made in Singapore and which were not, which were imported. He then asked me to segregate the parts that were not made in Singapore into high-value parts and low-value items and asked why the high-value parts were, made, were not made in-house. Well, this is really typical of his uh, economist training. He always asked the question as to whether part of this or full the full equipment could be produced in Singapore uh, with the technologies transferred to us, of course. Because he believed that uh, with the large number of good engineers in Singapore, we should be able to absorb these technologies uh, and, uh, and sort of build up our own capabilities in the production and, and maintenance of these, these weapon systems. And perhaps later even to do R&D activities. The first defence company to get going was the Chartered Industries of Singapore. More than just being self-sufficient, Dr Goh also felt the defence industry could help kick-start Singapore's industrialisation programme. But there was to be no such thing as an easy ride for the defence companies. You were never allowed to subsidise. Whatever we sold to Mindia was international pricing. There was no subsidy. When I was in charge of CIS, the price of my bullets, he asked for international quotation and check. So we have a hard time. A true visionary, Dr. Go saw opportunities where others didn't. So the CIS also ended up housing the Singapore Mint, producing coins, using equipment and tool making skills similar to those used for making weapons. Well, the technology level of our technical staff in Singapore in general because many of these uh, military equipment and weapon system consisted of very high technology, almost frontline uh, uh, te technical know-how and uh, as long as they are available to us, I think his plan was we should acquire them and uh, sort of jumpstart our, our uh, uh, high-tech industry. It is a little known fact today, but in the mid-1970s, the SAF operated a pineapple plantation and planted papayas too, on Dr. Goh's instructions. The pineapple plantation was at the Amoikui camp, home to the RSAF's 170 squadron. In a lot of our units, Air Force units, air bases, you can't grow trees, uh, you know, you got lots of open spaces and you spend a lot of money cutting grass. So he felt that perhaps why won't we use that land and put it to, to economic use. But although several thousand kilograms of pineapples were successfully harvested here each year, the pineapple project was eventually shelved after a few years. Those who had worked with Dr. Go said he had another concern. The growing SAF needed the best brains it can get to organize and to maintain it. This led to the introduction of the SAF Overseas Scholarships in 1971. The first five SAF scholars included Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung, Bui Tak Hap and Lai Sik Kui. The award is second only to the President's Scholarship in Prestige. But the ever pragmatic Dr. Goh was mindful getting the best talents for the SAF didn't stop here. One or two things had to be done. One was to, to open scholarships system to just not SAF scholars, but to others. 
to 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 to, to others doing local universities here, and, uh, and 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 we also monitor the the the, the people for fast track, not only SF scholars, but others people who we send to Sandhurst, people who send to Dunton in Australia, you know, who actually come back with a degree. So they all go into this pool, this Wrangler pool, and they are monitored. But Dr. Go was dissatisfied about one thing, and that's the way instructions issued by MINDEF had no impact, simply because they were ignored. To test out his theory, he issued what has come to be known as the nonsense memo. This was a memo without any instructions, save for a passage from the Bible on Noah's Ark. You know, Inez received it, uh, you know, the reaction was quite uh, hilarious in the sense that uh, uh, people really did not know what to make out of it. Uh, I think some of them looked at it, pass it down to the, to the subordinate and say, you know, see what you can do about it. I think he was doing an experiment, I think, you know, to find out uh, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's often said that, 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 that military officers uh, just take instructions and just do. They don't think. While this episode showed Dr. Goh's sense of humour, it also proved his worst fears correct. Only 10 units responded to the memo. Some queried its objective. The rest mostly ignored it. At the end of the experiment, he wrote a paper. Noah's Ark progresses through the SAF and circulated it to highlight how things needed to be changed. Dr. Goh was to serve twice as Defence Minister. By the time he left the ministry, he had built from scratch a fighting force of some 300,000 men. The SAF had gone from being resisted to being respected. After his success in the Finance and Defence Ministries, Dr. Goh earned himself the nickname Mr. Fixit. And soon enough, there was another problem for him to fix. Dr. Goh had churned out a fighting army from the men that went into it. But his experience in defence told him the educational level of the recruits was way below par. He was compelled to devise the famous Hokkien platoon so the dialect-speaking recruits could get by on simple commands. To him, it was an example of how, despite massive expenditure, the education system was failing. When I joined the Ministry of Education, the first thing which Dr. Goh says is that you have to go and meet this Hokkien platoon so that you will know what is the problem. So on a few occasions, I visited uh, army camps and uh, interacted with the soldiers there. And it was quite true. After whatever it is, 10 years of schooling, they came out of school, they were illiterate. So the question is, something must be wrong. And it cannot be that, uh, and Dr. Goh felt that, uh, it cannot be the fall of the soldiers, so it must be the fall of the system. And, it, and this cannot be allowed to continue. Goh's Daring Dozen was the nickname given to the team assembled by Dr. Goh to revamp the education system when he was appointed Education Minister in 1979. Most were systems engineers in their 20s with brilliant academic qualifications. Theirs was a high-profile assignment. They had to go to schools, talk to principals, teachers and those in the ministry to assess where to begin and what needed to be done. After six months, the report on the Ministry of Education, or the GO report, was released. Sweeping changes were recommended, not only in the way schools conducted their business, but in the philosophy of education. Streaming was introduced, a policy which recognized that different children are born with different abilities. Philosophy of education. Streaming was introduced, a policy which recognized that different children are born with different abilities. It was an unpopular policy, but to Dr. Goh, it was a practical, not an emotional issue. The high attrition rate in schools had led to wastage. The real problem, he argued, had to be tackled at source. 
the problem was, at that time, it was the philosophy of one size fits all. One curriculum for all the pupils of different abilities being taught at a single pace which was suitable only for the better pupils. So that's why Dr. Go felt that we should provide the opportunity for every child to achieve his maximum potential. In Singapore at the time, in 1979, I think that uh, this was a concept which was alien to the education establishment. And a lot of uh, parents also felt that if you label children at a very young age as being stupid, they would turn out to be stupid. And, that, uh, and there was the argument that some children are late bloomers and they'll take more time, which is all true. After he has devised his scheme, I'm sure that a lot of people would analyze it from a different angle and come up with different labels. But as far as Dr. Goh is, was concerned, uh, it was a problem that had to be fixed. For the benefit of the children, not for the benefit of the, uh, some abstract system of education. The streaming policy was not completely accepted by parents and even some teachers then. But the pragmatic Dr. Goh made sure his team had the backing to implement the changes. He needed somebody with Dr. Goh's authority to say, we've got a problem here, these are the set of solutions, we've got to organise ourselves and we've got to set this right. Uh, so he, has, he brought tremendous moral authority, uh, clear-headedness, firmness of purpose. As with anything that is very complicated, there are pluses and minuses. The minus side would be, as I said, pupils selected might feel that they are failures, uh, that they are labelled as failures. Uh, they did not stay on in the education system. They did not get the 10 years of education that we now make available. But the plus side is that the bilingual policy uh, worked in the school system because Dr. Goh's recommendations and carry through in terms of implementation made it a viable policy. Uh, and I think that has become very important for our nation. A few years after it's been implemented, I was still in education ministry, I remember, and Dr. Tengshin was the minister of state then. He did a sort of post-mortem review and uh, we found that we were pleased to denote that the attrition rate actually have dropped very significantly. Streaming was very much a fact of school life for almost 30 years and it raised the basic educational level of most students. But Dr. Goh didn't stop there. Other policies which also stemmed from his belief that each child should realize his full potential were introduced, sparking even more controversy. This included the gifted education program where the top 1% of each cohort was selected for accelerated learning. And the graduate mother policy where children of these mothers get priority admission in schools. Less controversial was the setting up of the Curriculum Development Institute and the revamping of all teaching materials. The foundations for the computerization drive in schools were also laid during these years. Dr. Goh's legacy in education was one of radical reform and transformation. Dr. Goh's vision for Singapore went beyond merely fulfilling the material needs of its people. For as he once put it, great drama and lively culture can thrive even with material shortcomings. Perhaps his constituents in Kreta Ayer experienced this most directly. The five-term MP had noted that Cantonese opera was a favourite leisure activity, but the area did not have a theatre. So in 1969, the first Crater Ayer People's Theatre, an open-air theatre, was built. Seeing him coming to such functions and sitting through, you can see that he must have enjoyed. Otherwise, you know, um, as MP, he could say, at interval time, go off, walk away. 
In later years, the open-air theatre was upgraded into a fully air-conditioned theatre, but that was not his only lasting contribution here. In, in those days, before 1960, um, all the hawkers were out in the open, the streets, Sago Street, Sago Lane, and Smith Street and so on, and he was uh, very concerned about them, open to the elements, you know, in the heat or in the rain all the time. So he thought of building a complex, a crater eye complex, and put all the hawkers into this complex under one roof. <laughs> In 1979, the Singapore Symphony Orchestra was born. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said it was Dr. Goh who convinced him that as a people, Singaporeans must have some feelings for the aesthetics in life. Dr. Goh had also pressed him to support companies like the SSO and the Bird Park, even though these did not make money. The person who was really behind the idea of an orchestra for Singapore it was Dr. Gawking Sui. And he, he provided the original impetus and later the support that was needed for the establishment of the SSO. We looked around for a possible conductor and then it was suggested, why don't we have one who is Singaporean? At the present moment, living in Europe, and so approaches were made to Mr. Chu Hui. For Dr. Go, nationhood meant more than just bread and butter issues. Dr. Go felt for a nation to have a resilience, to have a self-confidence for a people to uh, be able to cope with adversity and come through, you need something more than mat material goods. And uh, whether you call it the soul or the nature of a civilization, the character of a people, I mean, these are all words. But it does mean that some people are more resilient, stronger, psychologically than other people, able to overcome odds, climb higher. Is there a need for soul, you know? Yes, yes, there is a need, but you must never ask the government to provide the need for the soul. How does the soul come out then? When your tummy is full, then certain people think more than material goods. Like now? Is it happening They may now? go to arts, music, some will go to philosophy, whatever. But I don't think uh, you want the government to provide, uh, you know, uh, comfort for the soul. It's very dangerous. After some time, we tell you what to think. On the day-to-day -day practicalities of government, Dr. Goh was just as concerned with having the right people for the right job. It was during his years in Mindef that Dr. Goh first spotted and recruited many of Singapore's top public servants. Just in their 20s, they were given big responsibilities. He was one of those uh, bosses that you had who really did not care whether you're a man or a woman, whether you were, wore a skirt or you wore pants. I mean, all he was interested was that, you know, uh, in what you, your capability, what you could do. His management style was clear, decisive and direct. He gave and demanded high standards. It also gave him the reputation of being an impatient, no-nonsense man. But it was the impatience of a brilliant man, one who had too much to accomplish in too short a time. He had no time for red tape. Whether you were a general, or a major, or a colonel, or a young officer, whether you were a general, or a major, or a colonel, or a young officer, he would go straight to the person that he needed to do the job. Uh, so it was good from one point of view because what it meant was that a young officer w would be recognized quite early in his career. But then you had nothing to protect yourself if something went wrong, if you didn't produce a good piece of work 
Dr. Goh would know who did it. But those who worked with him say that underneath Dr. Goh's serious demeanor was a humorous man with a warm heart and a great capacity for learning. I remember when I was uh, already uh, MAS chairman. No, I mean, they come here. Philip, I need your help. Can you send me one of the computer guys to explain me computer? I said, no problem. I said, no, no, I don't want to just explain how to use computer. I want what's inside the computer. I want a person to open the computer, show me the parts and components. I said, wow. I said, you're very serious. Yeah, hey, I want to know what's inside it. I don't want to just see a terminal. You know, here's an old man, right? Chairman MAS, fairly retired, got other things to do. He's curious to see what is computer because they're learning to use. He said, I want to know what's inside. His curiosity is amazing. With whomever he, he interacted, he had the curiosity of a child. You know, he never showed his knowledge, but he always questioned, he always asked. And if he was captivated by something, then he would uh, pursue that further. I mean, he never uh, gave his views as the final. Dr. Goh's humanity was to show itself in 1972 when news came that one of the RSAF's early jet fighters, the Hunters, had crashed during training in the United Kingdom. At that time, he was visiting the Singapore High Commission in London. As they were coming down, uh, I pushed Dr. Lee Young Ling, the High Commissioner uh, at that time. Um, I told him that we had some, just received some bad news. One of our Hunters had just crashed, you know. And before I could even complete it, uh, Dr. Go, I think is, he was within hearing distance, he turned around to me and said, the pilot's safe? And I said, yes, sir. So then, you know, uh, he just said, all right, that's all right, you know. Plane can be written off. And then just walked out. And, and it was kind of anticlimax to me, you know. Uh, I, I had expected more questions coming, but, you know, he just walked. No, that, that is the kind of man he was, huh? and he is today, I guess. Um, great man. In 1984, Dr. Goh retired from politics. By then, he had been in the cabinet for 25 years, serving the last 11 as deputy prime minister. The range of his talent and abilities meant that even after his retirement from politics, he was still closely involved in Singapore's affairs. He was the invisible advisor to the EDB and was in demand as a consultant to other countries such as the economic advisor to China's coastal areas. Besides doing the honours at the launch of a book on the EDB, Dr. Goh published a trilogy of books on his own speeches and continued to write articles for publication. And in December 1996, a $2 million Go Keng Sui professorship was established at the National University of Singapore. Dr. Go was both a man of thought and a man of action. He broke new ground and took on new challenges throughout his public life. He wasn't a career soldier, yet he built up the armed forces from scratch. He wasn't a teacher, but yet he revamped the education system. He wasn't a zoologist or a bird expert, yet he built up the zoo and the bird park. He wasn't a musician, yet he pushed for the SSO. He was a problem solver. He was a visionary. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew once said Dr. Goh's biggest contribution to him personally was that Dr. Goh stood up to him. In challenging his decisions, Mr. Lee said Dr. Goh made him re-examine the premises on which they were made. Mr. Lee said this benign tension made for a healthy and fruitful relationship. He once told me that it's all right to be the number two, but you have to be a very useful number two. You constantly give value added. And as a number two, you have to sort of uh, realize your own value and contribution. And it is good complementary to quality and also uh, 
good that some people like to be at the forefront. They have the kind of uh, charisma to be the forefront, to carry the ground. Some people are just not too good at that, but they are excellent strategists, planner. They are excellent uh, problem solver. So he feels that he's more like that type. On their own, Dr. Goh will never may not make a good prime minister. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew would not have made a good defence minister or finance minister. But the two of them together was a tremendous combination. If it had been any other way, I think, you know, Singapore's history would, would have been written differently. But if we were fortunate in, in, in the congruence of, of having these two billion people, each with their, 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 their respective strength, being able to work together to synergize, to to see through Singapore's future. Modern Singapore in economic terms, I think is almost entirely Dr. Goh's work. Uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister, set the political framework. He fought the political battle. He won the people over to take a disciplined approach. And that's absolutely important, of course, because without that, uh, Dr. Goh's policies would not have succeeded. But it's Dr. Goh who thought of the various economic policies. He was very creative. We talk nowadays about our lack of entrepreneurship in Singapore. I think the greatest entrepreneur that Singapore has seen is Dr. Goh. In his letter of appreciation to Dr. Goh on his retirement in 1984, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said it was his good fortune to have strong men around him in cabinet and his debt to Dr. Goh was immeasurable. Mr. Lee said together with other old guard leaders like Mr. Ezra Duratnam and Dr. To Chin Chai, Dr. Goh had stiffened his morale at times of crises, which is when the mettle of a government is put to the test. When Dr. Goh stepped down, Mr. Rajaratnam paid tribute to Dr. Goh's support for the process of political self-renewal. Getting power, being a minister, demands great abilities, courage and so on. But more courageous, more commendable is a man who says, I've got power, I'm giving it back to the people. That is greatness. And Dr. Goh is one of them. In 1985, the country's highest honor, the Order of Tamasic First Class, was bestowed on Dr. Goh for his many contributions to the country. Perhaps Dr. Goh's own understanding of what it means to serve Singapore is best reflected in his words to the younger leaders entering politics just as he was leaving it. To the new guards soon joining us, may I say this. Welcome to you. Some of you will discover before long that you have joined a holy order that expects total commitment from you. That will be your moment of truth. You will then regard the present condition of the Republic not as a pinnacle of achievement, but as a base from which to scale new heights.